My name is Owen Bakshan. I'm an assistant professor of English here. I'm one of the um, co-founders and co-organizers of the speaker series, Marco, who was brave enough to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> who can't count, other. apparently. <laughs> yeah, sure. He's going to pay for it. <laughs> um, um, uh, he's the other um, uh, um, uh, co-founder, uh, Mark Weber, associate professor of English and Film Studies. I also see uh, Damian Fister here, who is our third uh, partner in crime. He's an assistant professor uh, at the Communication Studies uh, program. And our fourth uh, partner, uh, Jeanette Jones, uh, uh, an associate professor at the um, uh, History Department, could not make it uh, tonight. Um, let me start by saying that um, then a few words about next year, because now Marco introduced the, the problem. Um, <laughs> we have already, although this is going to be the 16th uh, Humanities on the Edge lecture since the inception of this uh, series in the fall semester of 2010, uh, and we have already successfully uh, lined up next year's uh, speakers, so we have actually five speakers for next year then. And the topic of this year's series was um, Economies of Crisis, Crises of Economies. The um, idea behind the, the series this year was to address the, the rhetoric of crisis that seems to be invading every single aspect of our lives, not just on an everyday basis, but also on the institutional basis. So we invited speakers um, that we believe could address uh, what we, we call the economization of crisis in, uh, in one way or, or another. So the topic of next year is, uh, is going to be uh, states of exception. The state of exception, this concept has emerged in uh, philosophy over the last couple of years as a common way of describing the historical present. As the argument goes, we are now encountering more and more situations in which standard, normal, legal situations are temporarily suspended. But we, what we come to find out is that temporal suspension actually means permanent transformation. Right? Think of, for example, you know, the global war on terror. For for a time being, we are willing to give up certain democratic rights in the name of democracy. The question is, are they ever going to come back or not? So next year's topic is going to be states of exception. We have invited five speakers there who will address um, this um, permanent state of exception from uh, five different uh, disciplinary points of views. First will be uh, Ursula Heise from UCLA and she's going to go at it from the perspective of ecology. The second speaker will be Greg, uh, Greg Lambert from Syracuse University, who is going to address it from the perspective of political theory and philosophy. The third speaker will be Siva Bajanathan from University of Virginia, who is going to address it from the perspective of media studies. And Adam Kotzko uh, from Shiner College will talk about uh, um, the devil, actually, and he's going to come at it from the perspective of religious studies. The fifth speaker that we um, um, uh, had to sort of uh, uh, reschedule is going to be Cristina Rodriguez. She is a professor of law at Yale University, the first Latina to be um, um, tenured by Yale University's um, uh, law department, and she's going to talk about the immigration crisis. So that's uh, uh, what we have lined up for next year. So before we let you go for the summer, I just wanted to implant these ideas and um, advertise uh, the fact that we do have a Facebook page. So if you want to keep up with the events, uh, please uh, uh, like us on Facebook. We not only talk about the events, but if our speakers have you know, new publications, we usually promote those as well on the um, uh, Facebook page. Okay, so the first and, uh, first and foremost, and I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, a lot of people contributed uh, to this uh, speaker series this year. So it's uh, uh, only um, uh, it's, it's definitely um, a great honor for us to acknowledge their contributions. I'd like to start by mentioning Humanities Nebraska, uh, who uh, contributed to this um, uh, speaker series. And this also explains what Marco is doing upstairs. As part of the grant that we received from Humanities Nebraska, we asked you to um, uh, fill out these um, uh, forms so that we can provide the necessary uh, feedback to um, Humanities Nebraska. In addition, then, we received funds, uh, uh, funds from the departments of English, History, Communication Studies, the Institute uh, for Ethnic Studies, the Committee on LGBT Concerns, the LGBTQA Resource Center, as well as UNL's Faculty Senate and uh, Research Council. Finally, I'd also like to uh, thank the um, Sheldon Museum of Art uh, for allowing us to use this uh, wonderful venue. 
and specifically um, uh, Daniel Veneziano, who is now uh, departed from this institution and will begin, I think he's already begun uh, in New York City. Um, it was wonderful to work with him, so we are in, in fact very grateful for his um, help and uh, support of the speaker series. And I don't know if he's here, but I wanted to mention our artist, I don't see Anthony Holly here, and I wanted to uh, thank him for his continued work on the design of the uh, posters that he, uh, he's relying on. So it is my you know, honor now to introduce our speaker today. And uh, you know, this is one of those difficult moments. We just had this discussion, how do you pronounce his name? Right? And this is not easy. Uh, Imre happens to be a fellow Hungarian, so I have the, I have the authentic line on the pronunciation. <laughs> it's, uh, 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 the name itself, however, is of German origin, so I'm going to pronounce it as Imre Zeman, but uh, the Hungarian pronunciation could be, uh, uh, I've heard it's Seman, also Seman, also. So, um, I, in, in these situations, I usually just tell my students, it's enough if you call me Roland. <laughs> Don't even bother with the last name, you know, just call me Roland, that's uh, possible. In your case, that's the other thing I'm saying, in your case, even this fail, this strategy fails. <laughs> just call him the Canadian. You know. <laughs> Uh, you know, Seyman is, is an internationally uh, known um, uh, expert on what I would call the culture of politics of globalization, even if he is critical of the very term globalization by now. He is an extremely uh, prolific and well known author, and I counted at least 13 books that he either uh, authored, co authored, edited, or co edited. Several of these titles already had several um, uh, editions, two or three editions by now. And he's currently also working on a number of uh, projects. He's the author of more than 50 journal articles and at least 30 um, uh, book chapters. So I'm not going to list all of these for you now, but I would like to definitely mention the titles of um, some of his books. He's the author of Zones of Instability, Literature, Postcolonialism, and the Nation for 2003, co author of Popular Culture, User's Guide. It's one of those titles that already have gone through three editions. Uh, after Globalization from 2011, he's also co-editor of Pierre Bourdieu, Fieldwork in Culture, also the Johns Hopkins Guide to Literary Theory and Criticism, again it's in its second edition by now, um, Culture, Theory and Anthology uh, from 2010, Contemporary Literary and Culture Theory, the Johns Hopkins Guide from 2012. Her, uh, his uh, current projects include an introductory text on cultural theory and a monograph on the culture and politics of oil. And if I understand it correctly, tonight's talk is taken from that uh, particular project. In addition to being uh, you know, an author of uh, all these books, he's received um, several honors and recognitions. He's the recipient of the John Polanyi Prize in Literature from 2010, the Petro Canada Young Innovator Award from 2003, the, the Scotia Bank Award for Excellence in Internationalization from 2004. He's also a recipient of an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship from 2005 to 2007, uh, the President's Award for um, Excellence in Graduate Supervision at McMaster University, his previous uh, institution, and the Kilham Emir Professorship in 2013. Uh, I'd like to mention that he's a founding member of the Canadian Association of Cultural Studies, as well as a founding member of the U.S. Cultural Studies Association. Um, uh, before I uh, let him uh, take the um, uh, stage, I wanted to mention that uh, we are going to have a radio interview with him tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock at the uh, uh, NET's uh, Friday Light at the Mill Show. So if you're interested, please uh, tune in. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Imre to UNL. for being here and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I, this is a little bit long. Um, I think it's acceptably long. So I don't want to do any scene setting or staging of this in, in my current work. Um, we can do that afterward if you like. All I will say is that this book has two sections, two big sections. One is called Oil and Aesthetics and the second is called Oil and Philosophy. And this, this section is taken from the Oil and Philosophy part. Uh, also, I'll, I will um, apologize in advance for uh, places where you may see the cuts, um, but hopefully it'll come across. Um, hopefully, the, the, the argument will come across well. So, the, a subtitle to this talk may also be "How to Know About Oil." 
um, or energy epistemologies and political futures, and that's what I'm going to kick off on. There's lots of images, so don't worry. <laughs> how to know about oil. Is how the right question through which to frame an inquiry into, cons into the contemporary significance of oil? Is an epistemic question the right one? After all, don't we know, already know everything we need to know about this substance? That this substance on which we depend for much of our energy generates geopolitical misadventures, environmental destruction, and for some at least, massive profits? Don't we already know that because it is of necessity a limited resource, that our dependence on it constitutes something like, something like a, a civilizational category mistake? One that we are unlikely to rectify, not because we can't identify the error, but because we are people who live in society so saturated with the substance that we cannot imagine doing without it. What could we possibly learn by thinking about how we know oil, as opposed to thinking about the ways in which we've lived with it and what we need to do to live without it? There's two things implied in the how that I want to talk about this evening. The first aims to draw attention to the multiple ways in which oil is framed as both problem and possibility, implying in turn multiple forms of being in relation to it. Oil is a physical substance, a thing identified by a concrete noun, like a chair or a tree, rather than an idea, than an idea named by an abstract one, such as belief or identity. Even so, oil only has such significance as it does for us as a result of the cultural narratives that shape our understanding of it. Despite, despite being a concrete thing, Oil animates and enables all manner of abstract categories, including freedom, mobility, growth, entrepreneurship, and the future, and animates these all in an essential way. Just to give you some sense of this. How is also meant to point to the fact that making oil part of our knowing, making it a key component of our investigations on whatever topic, changes how and what we know. Oil, and indeed energy more generally, has almost always been seen as an external input into our social cultural systems and histories, a material resource squeezed into a social form that pre-existed, rather than the other way around. We do not commonly see it, oil or energy, as giving shape to the social life that, that it fuels. It is thus that we imagine that life as we know it can continue along in its absence or disappearance, simply through the introduction of new alternative sources of energy. With enough political will and technological innovation, we have a strong tendency to believe that wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear energy could generate the kilojoules we have come to expect from fossil fuels, and do so in a way that would change our energy inputs while retaining the quality and form of life that many, though far from all, now enjoy. But what I want to ask tonight, what I want to think about tonight, is what if oil is fundamental to the societies we have now? shaping them in every possible way and at every possible level, from the scale of our populations to the nature of our built infrastructure, from the objects we have ready to hand to our agricultural and food systems, and from the possibility of movement and travel to expectations of the capacity to move and interact, not to mention the plastics used to encase our smartphones and other high-tech devices. How we know about oil at the present moment tends to under, undervalue its impact and significance as a condition of possibility of modernity and of the full development of capitalism. If we insist on understanding modernity as an oil modernity and of capitalism as an oil capitalism, this can't help but force us to reconsider how we understand both, as well as the ways in which left politics has been shaped over the past two centuries in response to the conditions produced by these, this capitalism and this modernity. In the fragment on machines, in the Grundrisse, Karl Marx famously imagines a world in which technology has advanced to such a point that human labor is no longer required. Yet even were we to achieve a world without work, doesn't seem very likely right now, the machines would still need oil to operate them, and the social systems and infrastructures inhabited by the laborers now free to do what they want, suburbs, highways, and the entertainment systems organized around them, these infrastructures would be ones that were brought into existence by oil and would need it, need, it, need it to make it all operate. So I want to explore today what we might learn from three distinct attempts to probe the consequences 
of how we know oil and how we might make oil a more conceptually powerful part of our knowing. The first of these constitutes a reframing of the history of left politics in relation to changes in dominant forms of energy, specifically as this is, this is explored in Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy. The second, Edward Bertinsky's well-known and widely exhibited photo series called Oil, narrates and names the social significance of oil through experiments in visual form. Finally, I'll conclude with the struggle over the representation of the Alberta oil sands in public and political debate and discussion, looking here too at what happens when oil circulates as a contested cultural narrative, as opposed to being merely a physical entity about which there's little dispute or debate. We stand at a moment when there's a broad understanding and awareness of the need to make a transition from a global society based around non-renewable forms of energy to renewables. One of the reasons that there have been interventions into how we know oil and energy from multiple directions is that public knowledge about the environmental repercussions of oil usage or the consequences of its necessarily limited supply seem to have generated limited political and social response and nothing on the scale uh, or with the speed required. Baklov Smil has pointed out, and he's an engineer uh, based at the University of Manitoba, has pointed out that lessons, quote, lessons of the past energy transitions may not be particularly useful for appraising and handicapping the coming energy transition because it will be exceedingly difficult to restructure the modern high energy industrial and post industrial civilization on the basis of non fossil, that is, overwhelmingly renewable fuels and flows. I argue tonight, here in this paper, that these attempts to narrate new ways to know oil have lessons for a left politics committed to an energy transition that would both ameliorate environmental concerns and enable greater social justice. The politics, presumptions, and implications of each of these ways of knowing oil, knowing it in order to understand just what it has meant for us moderns, varies, of course, and this is part of the point. Taken together, I think these three narratives I'll show tonight point to important barriers to actions and thresholds of possibility that we need to consider as we work against the overwhelming media and political promotion of oil as a benign force for good, to say nothing of the weight of quotidian comfort of our societies. These various hows draw attention to the compelling political openings that emerge once we accept and understand the ways that oil and energy animate our cultural narratives. They point, too, to the very real challenges and difficulties of trying to produce a different way of being in relation to a source of energy that has produced the societies we inhabit and has made us the subjects that we are. So the first of these three narratives. If you, if you want to shorthand, it's history, aesthetics, I guess the last one is politics. It's no exaggeration to suggest that the 20th century would have, not, would, have, would have not been the same without oil. A source of energy easy to store and transport, with a huge, a huge energy output per unit of fuel, and which forms the basis of all manner of other substances without which it's hard to imagine life on the planet today. Histories of the century that are alert to the significance of energy inevitably provide a vision of the recent past in which the presence of oil is amongst the central forces shaping human life if not indeed the single earth force to which all other narratives can be connected. For example, William McNeil's Environmental History of the 20th Century, Something New Under the Sun, quickly identifies the capacities, technologies, and infrastructures enabled by fossil fuels to be the single most important factor in the massive expansion of population over the century, which in turn generates the even larger increases in water consumption, CO2 production, and much more. The figures are staggering. A fourfold increase in world population, a 17 fold increase in CO2 production, and a 40 fold increase in industrial output. And this just to begin with. Daniel Jurgen's Pulitzer Prize winning commodity biography, The Prize The Epic Quest for Oil, Money, and Power, also places oil at the heart of human activity since its discovery for industrial uses in the late 19th century in Pennsylvania. One could pick almost any aspect of Jurgen's book to make the case for the historical significance of oil, especially for the shape of economic and geopolitical history. In Jurgen's account, for instance, much of what passes for military strategy in World War II can be reduced to the ceaseless appetite of mechanized armies for oil. Japan and Germany began from positions of energy weakness. 
no oil on native soil. A Pearl Harbor, for instance, Jurgen thus writes that, quote, the primary target of this huge campaign remained the oil fields of the East Indies, end quote. The attack in the U.S., in Jurgen's account at least, was carried out in order to protect the Japanese flank and to safeguard tanker routes to the home island from Borneo and Sumatra. At their worst, such histories can be reducted in a bad sense, that is, seeing crude as always and, all, and everywhere the disease that generates the symptom called history with its attendant traumas, dislocations, and crises. On the other hand, an attention to the importance of oil contributes an essential and all too often missing element of our social and political narratives. The way in which energy, um, uh, which energy, objects, and infrastructure exert demands on and shape human actions and decisions, giving form to the character and nature of political, political social, and cultural systems. Timothy, some of the slides are just for color. So I won't be talking about that specifically, but um, just so you know. Uh, Timothy Mitchell's book, Carbon Democracy, Political Power in the Age of Oil, offers just the kind of re-narration that I've been talking about here. Uh, re-narration of the politics of the petrocarbon era that is alert to the material significance of oil in shaping capacity and possibility, from the form taken by local struggles over oil to the shape of 20th century geopolitical conflict. Mitchell's book, is not about democracy and oil, but about democracy as oil. His aim is to show that, quote, carbon energy and modern democratic politics were tied intricately together, end quote. The democracy to which he refers is a mode of governing populations that employs popular consent as a means of limiting claims for greater equality and justice by dividing the common world. By reading modern democracy as oil, as made possible by and enabled by oil in a fundamental way, in a fundamental material way, Mitchell creates an alternative history that produces all manner of com compelling conceptual openings for left and environmental politics. There are two points from Mitchell's book that I want to draw particular attention to here tonight. The first is his remarkable account of the political effects of the emergence of the use of coal as a source of energy on a broad scale. One of the social transformations produced by coal was for the first time that the vast majority of people in industrialized countries became dependent on energy produced by others. The production of coal at specific sites across northern Europe that then had to be channeled to other sites along narrow railway corridors with specialized groups of workers operating in large numbers at both ends generated the material conditions for a form of political agency that could be asserted through the, through the disruption of energy flow. He writes, the rise of mass democracy is often attributed to the emergence of new forms of political consciousness. What was missing was not consciousness, though, not a repertoire of demands, but an effective way of forcing the powerful to listen to those demands. The ability of workers to effectively and immediately disrupt energy flow through mass strikes or sabotage gave the political, the, their political demands a special force in the Cold Era and led to major gains for workers between the 1880s and the interwar decades, while also supporting the development of workers' consciousness of their social circumstances. For Mitchell, the switch to oil from coal as a primary energy source for the global north in the 1920s onward was a major factor in impeding the demands of labor and constituted the basis for a form of governmentality that managed the struggle for democracy. The production of oil, unlike coal, unlike coal, the production of oil requires fewer workers in relation to the amount of energy produced. Laborers remain above ground in the sight of managers, and from the 1920s, quote, 60 to 80 percent of world, world oil production was exported, end quote, which made it difficult to affect supply by strikes. Mitchell is quite blunt in his claim. The mass politics that emerged alongside coal, that we're still kind of familiar with the politics of the strike, was defeated by the rise of fossil fuel networks that made mass, mass action more difficult and change the conditions within which class struggle took place. A second point from Mitchell's book that I want to draw attention to is the discourse of economics that has played a key role in the system of democratic governmentality that Mitchell explores. Here too, oil plays an essential, <clears throat> if hitherto unrecognized role. Mitchell argues that the economy as an object didn't exist in its current form prior to the Second World War. Before that, before that time, the economy referred to a process and not a thing, whose management was to become the central task of governments 
and of a cohort of specialists who would produce knowledge about it. 19th century political economy concentrates on the prudent management of resources, especially, sorry, applied especially to the resource that had made industrial civilization possible, that is, to coal. This is an economy understood in terms of limits and scarcity. The shift from coal to oil en enables a significant change in how the economy is conceptualized and governed. Nature is now removed from economic calculations. In the place of natural resources and energy flows, economics becomes the measurement of money, and the economy transforms into a measurement of the sum of all the moments at which money changes hands. Mitchell argues that, quote, the conceptualization of the economy as a process of monetary circulation defined the main feature of the new object. It could expand without getting physically bigger. Right, am I changing the yes. uh, light sources here or something else? Um, as the dominant source of the century, the dominant energy source of the century, or if not the dominant, then the hegemonic one, oil enables the idea of the economy as an object to grow without limit in two ways. First, because of its continuous decline in price adjusted for inflation over much of the century, the cost of energy was thought to have little bearing on economic activity or on economic decision making. Energy now appeared uh, virtually free within overall calculations of the economy. Second, abundance of oil and the ability to move it wherever needed made it possible to treat it as inexhaustible. Mitchell concludes, democratic politics develop, thanks to oil, with a particular orientation towards the future, the future was a limitless horizon of growth. This horizon was not some natural reflection of a time of plenty. It was the result of a particular way of organizing expert knowledge and its objects in terms of a novel world called the economy. So, left politics on the one hand, the economy on the other. The first impeded by the appearance of oil, the second fueled by it. Mitchell provides us with a shift in how we know oil that produces new possibilities for how we might act in relation to it. The connection between the apparent limitlessness of energy and our expectations of an economy that must, of necessity, continue to grow at all costs, offers insight, for instance, into the struggles faced by countries after the 2008 market crash. For economist Jeff Rubin, and for others, other economists as well, one of the reasons for the difficulty of the economic recovery can be put down to a single factor, the high price of oil, which at US, the US current price of oil is about $90 to $100 per barrel, is close to 50-fold its average price during the period of capitalism's greatest expansionary phase from the 1920s to the 1970s. How to imagine either stable liberal capitalist democracies or to consider alternative social formations requires us to carefully consider the role played by energy in shaping both their material realities and social imaginaries the expectations for expansion and growth that oil has set up, which is proving challenging for the left to think otherwise in a concrete way in a world with an ever-expanding population and expanding middle-class desires. So that's, that's the economy on the one hand. As for the politics of street actions and general strikes, while it would be reductive to suggest that the switch from coal to oil as a dominant source of energy has had long ago eliminated or reduced the efficacy of labor actions, it's worth taking seriously the connection between political action and energy. The difficulty of impeding the operations of capital today in anything like the way that may have been possible at the mine site is clear. Major pipelines circumvent political action, political hotspots, and or are buried beneath the ground. And with the exception of environmental movements who draw attention to the causes and consequences of oil extraction and usage, almost nowhere is left political action organized directly in relation to energy as it once was. While well, the decisions by the global Occupy movement not to issue specific demands or to insist on any direct outcome as a result of their street occupations has been viewed by some analysts as a rejection of the whole of late capitalist democracy and its presumptions, it can also be viewed as the last gasp of a form of political protest that, at least understood from the vantage point of oil and energy, has, alas, long been outmoded, that of the street action. Mitchell's carbon democracy insists on the significance of oil to political form and possibility. And in doing so, in naming just how deeply energy shapes political form, he appears to rule out some of the forms of concrete action on which the left has traditionally relied on to communicate to publics. At the same time, oil fuels the fantasies of limitless expansion in a way that has proved difficult to challenge or counteract. 
whether or not such growth is sustainable in the long run. How then, how then might one explain or explore the political significance of oil to publics, especially given the need for large-scale, rapid energy transition? Might aesthetics succeed where street politics have failed? Aesthetics and politics, part two. Near the end of his investigation of oil society, this book called The Long Emergency, James Howard Kunstler argues that we are unlikely to address our dependence on oil. Such doubts about the capacity for, for, uh, the, radi for the radical change necessary to produce a new mode of social and economic organization are today all too common. In his groundbreaking 1992 essay called Petrofictions, Amitav Ghosh argues that one of the reasons for an absence of fictions about oil and about the social and political encounters that this substance has produced is because it is, quote, a problem that can be written about only in the language of solutions. A subject better, so that's the sorry, end quote, a problem that can only be written about in the language of solutions. A subject better suited to the binaries of public policy or political science than to the language of aesthetics that deals with contradiction and irresolution. Just to give a little context to that, Amitav Ghosh asked the question of why there are so few uh, fictions about oil, given the prominence and importance of this of this fuel to American economies and to American, um, well, to American politics and social life post post World War II. And he means not not just domestically, but also in the encounters with uh, the Middle East. Despite such worries and cautions, over the past decade there has been a growing body of work in art and literature committed to naming and explaining oil with the aim of producing changes in our social imaginary about this substance. One such project is Edward Bertinsky's photo essay, Oil, which is made up of both new and old images addressing the topic of oil from every possible angle. In Bertinsky's characteristic style, which emphasizes scale, number, and hidden realities, these photos prompt shock and awe in the face of the visual representation of the sheer size of the sites of oil extraction, the varied infrastructures that enable it to course through the veins of global society, and the brute evidence of its physical, environmental, and social consequences. Bertinsky describes oil as the outcome of an oil epiphany, and this is his description of the oil epiphany here, that he had in 1997, which made him recognize this epiphany, that his photo practice had been about oil all along. Oil, the photo essay, is divided into three sections intended to document the life cycle of the substance, passing from the first part, which is extraction and refinement, to a second part called transportation and motor culture, to a third called the end of oil. The photos that make up each section are heterogeneous in theme and, and content, and photographed at numerous locations around the world. Extraction and refinement includes slides, includes sorry, images of older oil fields in the California desert, which are jam-packed with drill rigs and pump jacks, include the expansive, um, the expansive oil sands extraction sites and tailing ponds surrounding Fort McMurray, Alberta. These are, these are pipelines um, of the kind that I know some of you want to talk about that are coming from uh, the oil sands. There are images of the complex, visually dynamic twists and turns of refinery structures in Ontario, Newfoundland, and in Texas as well. The second part, transportation and motor culture, begins with a series of Escher-like images of enormous highway interchanges before transporting us to massive car import lots in the US and China, and ending, in, uh, and ending in photos of sites at which people accumulate around the fantasy of driving, as in the biker and trucker jamborees held in Sturgis, South Dakota, and Walcott, Iowa. If the photos in these first two sections draw our attention to the apparatuses and infrastructures that produce and are produced by oil, from sites of extraction largely hidden from view, to the quotidian landscape of highways and car lots, the final series, The End of Oil, probes the consequences of oil society, especially through the detritus that it leaves behind. The multiple images of the ancient oil fields of Baku, as well as of uh, gigantic graveyards of cars, helicopters, planes, jet engines, tires, and oil drums, are concluded with a sequence of photos uh, on which Bertinsky first made his fame which are the shipbreaking yards of Chittagong, Bangladesh, where 19th century labor meets 20th century garbage through the mechanism of 21st century offshoring of multinational capitalism's expenses and responsibilities. Oil is a photo narrative, an attempt to tell a story through images. 
if you were to see the exhibit, uh, these three different um, sections would be in three different uh, galleries or three different sections of a museum, and you'd kind of go through them so you'd see the life cycle of oil through, via these images. To visualize the world as it is due to oil, Bertinsky pieces this narrative together out of his existing large body of images in an effort to produce a tale that might generate in its viewers the same oil epiphany that produced their production. One of the questions oil raises is not just whether it succeeds in its political and pedagogic aim, which is probably too blunt of a question to be asked to such a diverse set of images in any case, but what we're to make of the visual mechanisms that Bertinsky employs in his photos and their capacity to name the central place of oil in our social imaginaries and ontologies. The impulse of documentary photography with political intent is to engage in a form of didactic exposé, to introduce to vision otherwise hidden practices or spaces that we should know about but don't, either because we don't want to or because we aren't meant to. Bertinsky's images retain some of this basic didactic impulse, but I think there's more going on here. His attention to the spectacle of scale and the elevated vantage point from which his images are taken simultaneously exemplify and critique the enduring fantasy of Enlightenment knowledge. The God's Eye's perspective produces the enormity everywhere on display, a form of knowledge that makes it possible to see the outcome of petrol societies, but which is also able to create those economic and social systems that are able to leave signs of human activity on a planetary scale. Bertinsky's deserts are filled to the brim with cars and planes, and his images of garbage dumps on a similarly otherworldly scale track the detritus left behind when each of these is junked. An epiphany means to understand the familiar how in some new way. In another register, it can mean that one finally comes to understand that one doesn't understand, or can't possibly understand, what humanity hath wrought to the planet as a result of oil. The feeling one gets in moving through Bertinsky's photo narrative of oil from birth to death is more of the latter than the former, the dissipation of knowledge as opposed to its expansion. And this is, I think, to his credit. The painful and beautiful images on display in oil never stoop to render oil manageable, not even fully graspable, except as a dimension of contemporary social life whose reality we can no longer hide from. To go back to Gosh's statement. Here we see no solution posed to the problem on display, except perhaps to suggest that the accepted language of solutions is always already part of a system that made the problem identifiable as such. Wow, that's convoluted. Mitchell points out that since there is no way to distinguish between beneficial and harmful growth, quote, the increased expenditure required to deal with the damage caused by fossil fuels appears as an addition rather than an impediment of growth." End quote. All of the images collected in oil are images of growth, including the garbage graveyards and shipbreaking beaches. Oil confirms Kunstler's worries, but it does so in a way that might yet generate the capacity for new social imaginaries. One of the major difficulties faced by any aesthetic encounter with oil is the apparent capacity for the substance to absorb all critique, in much the same way that it absorbs light. In his critical reaction to Leo Lanya's play Conjuncture in 1928, which deals with the effects of an oil strike in Albania, Bertolt Breck remarked that, quote, petroleum resists the five-act form, end quote. When novels, novelists or visual artists decide to focus on oil, to look at its environmental impact, the nature of the society that it fuels, the folly of depending on a finite energy source, it's because they wish to inform and to unsettle quotidian beliefs and behaviors, thereby activating a response in their readers and viewers with respect to oil. But as Brecht had intuited, the unique position of oil at the heart of contemporary society troubles the always already uneasy relationship between aesthetics and politics. The serious consequences of petro societies demands a major and speedy collective response to a social problem almost without precedent. Whether this can be accomplished through aesthetic or cultural means, or whether the social significance of oil means that we occupy a novel situation for critical aesthetic practice with respect to society and the environment, remains an open question. What work such as Bertinsky's points to is the difficulty for aesthetics to generate the kind 
and level of understanding required to produce desired social or political outcomes. If Brecht is right, and oil contains aesthetics somehow, it contains or dissipates the critique generated by aesthetics, it may be that the only way to deal with the substance is by not taking it head on, but by trying instead to make more fully sensible the shape and form of the world to which oil gave birth and which it continues to fill with the energy it needs for us to survive. Last section, <clears throat> ethical oil. <clears throat> Making oil a central part of our histories introduces genuinely new insights into the shape they've taken and the politics that, they might, that might be appropriate to the current moment. Considering the ways in which oil is framed and named in aesthetics might allow us to understand whether we can know it differently through art in some way that could enable us to reposition it in our daily practices and create new social imaginaries. These two ways of knowing oil might be interesting and important, but also might seem to be less significant than, significant than the place in which a daily war is being waged about how we should or can think about oil, which is in the media and the political sphere. This is perhaps especially true um, in Canada, in contemporary Canadian society. There's a concerted representational struggle being carried out on multiple fronts, nationally and internationally, about the significance of the Alberta oil sands, a place once of interest only to geologists, but now part of everyday debate and discussion. And the front, front page debate in national newspapers in Canada every single day. With the reclassification in 2002 of the oil sands as part of the country's proven reserves, Canada's oil stock jumped from 5 billion barrels to 180 billion barrels, making it the second highest in the world after Saudi Arabia. Oil and gas now represent 40% of total Canadian exports, more than double what they were in 1995. And according to Natural Resources Canada, in 2010 the energy sector accounted for 6.8% of total Canadian GDP. It's now closer to 7%. As the relative importance of manufacturing declines, and as population shifts away from the east coast and central Canada towards the west, for both economic and demographic reasons, political power and influence has also moved out west. The development of the oil sands is strongly opposed by environmental and First Nations groups who have vocally and effectively drawn attention to the ecological trauma inflicted by the processes used in bitumen extraction. Opponents include not only those actors and environmentalists who have picketed the White House to try to influence the decision-making process with respect to the approval of the Keystone XL pipeline, but also in Canada, the opposition New Democratic Party. NDP leader Thomas Mulcair, Mulcair, Mulcair has come out as a forceful opponent of the oil sands, but, but in, opposite, uh, in contrast to Justin Trudeau, the leader of the other opposition party, the Liberal Party, who's a proponent of the energy industry and tries to make sure they get photos of uh, him with uh, energy leaders whenever he can. In Mulcair's view, the oil sands have created a Canadian version of the Dutch disease a decline in manufacturing linked to the artificial inflation of the value of the Canadian dollar. In British Columbia, former NDP leader Adrian Dix put together a legal team led by a prominent specialist in environmental, aboriginal, and resource law to help him devise a possible legal challenge to Enbridge's Northern Gateway pipeline. This pipeline would take bitumen from oil sands to the west coast for transport to China, what is seen by the federal government as an essential expansion of the market for Canadian oil. In both cases, NDP opposition is an explicitly political ploy. Nationally, to gain support in the shaky economies of Quebec and Ontario. Politically, to hopefully win over the, an electorate which broadly supports the environment and is suspicious of the intentions of companies to make, profit at any, make profits at any cost. The federal government and industry groups have not stood idly by. In the 2012 budget, in addition to substantial cuts to a number of federal government ministries, the Conservatives announced a significant change to environmental review process for new industrial projects. And in addition to changes to process and policy, the government has ramped up their rhetoric in support of the oil sands on a number of fronts. Alarmingly, the federal government, um, the federal government has begun to put pressure on environmental groups, suggesting that any who are involved in what might be deemed to be political advocacy could lose their status as charitable foundations. They've also suggested that the foreign contributions such organizations receive constitute the meddling of outsiders in internal affairs, a national populist ploy that's com completely unheard of in Canadian politics before that. This has already had an impact 
on some well sense critics. Prominent scientist and environmentalist David Suzuki resigned from the board of the foundation that bears his name. Well, the charity Forest Ethics has created a separate group to make counterclaims to the government's representations of the oil sands and Canadian environmentalists. For the claims, counterclaims, and rhetorical appeals of industry to function, they need to be seen as more than simply advocacy on the part of parties interested in profit at whatever cost to the planet. Industry groups have made a point of widely advertising their efforts to reclaim oil sands land and to act as responsible stewards of the environment over the past several years. <coughs> And in addition to these kinds of um, um, ads that go into magazines and into newspapers, um, one of the things that, are, that cinema going audiences, if you go to see a movie in Canada, what you have to endure is um, you have to sit through adverts by companies like Synovus that um, make a claim for the importance of their, uh, you, you see, I guess you see ads for car, car companies and you see ads for Synovus saying that they have new bitumen extraction technologies that exemplify Canadian innovation and Canadian can-do attitude. Um, they, they point out that Canadians can withstand winter because they have this can-do attitude. And that Canada's spelled with a can, not a can't. It's a really embarrassing <laughs> ad campaign. And, and uh, audiences uh, tend to chuckle when, when they see it. Um, but it's nevertheless there. And they, they, I recently went to film and they have another ad campaign that makes a, a similar case on behalf of their innovation in extracting this oil. <clears throat> Taking no chances, proponents of oil sands development have also flirted with a philosophical discourse about the oil sands, and ethics related to the form and shape of their development. The Ezra Levant's book, Ethical Oil, The Case for Canada's Oil Sands, is not really a, it's not a genuinely philosophical or theoretical text, and nor is it an especially well-argued book, tending towards high school debate club style dismissals of opponents' positions, through the deployment of what are at, time, at times relatively crude forms of rhetoric and over-reliance on the identification of contradictions or expressions of startled surprise at uh, the discovery of, of supposed hypocrisies and that kind of thing. <clears throat> For all this, however, it articulates themes that lurk beneath many of the representational strategies of business and government concerning the oil sands. These make an appeal not only to science and to economic necessity in the struggle for what, what Seminay Howe has termed anthropocentric eco-authority, but they also make appeals to the good and right course of action. Whatever else ethics might be, they're intended to constitute the elaboration of the axioms and principles around which action and pra practice is shaped and governed, whether with respect to individuals, groups, or even non-human beings. Levant's book provides no such account. There's no axioms here about how it should be ethical towards the oil. I, I'm not even sure what that would look like, but um, I'd be curious for him to do it. It doesn't provide that kind of ethics. Rather, it engages in a broad attack on what he sees as the misguided ethics of those opposed to the development of the oil sands, alongside a concerted defense of industry practices. His arguments are anchored in a single core claim. <clears throat> oil, uh, just Ezra Levant is a bit, for those, some of you might know more about Canada than others, he's a bit of a, a running joke in Canada. Having said that though, this book is, this kind of claim is serious enough that it appears in biographies of um, CEOs of oil sands companies. They repeat it, they see it as articulating a fact that you can't get beyond that uh, asserts the blunt necessity of having Canadian oil amongst uh, any, any other kind of oil. And they're, they're speaking to the U.S., frankly. I don't know if anybody's reading this here in the U.S., but nevertheless. Oil, this is his kind of central claim. Oil is an international commodity. If an oil-thirsty country such as China or the United States can't buy oil from one country, they'll buy it from another. So even if the oil sands were to completely shut down, the world wouldn't use one barrel less. It would just buy that oil from the oil sands competitors, places like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Sudan, and Nigeria. The question is not whether we should use oil sands, oil instead of some perfect fantasy fuel that hasn't yet been invented. Until that miracle fuel is invented, the question is whether we should use oil from the oil sands or oil from, some other, from the other places in the world that would pump it. Levant is unequivocal. By every possible ethical measure, whether human rights records, labor practices, or, and I think this most, more, most dubiously, environmental policies, Canada comes out ahead of its petrol competitors. He writes, for instance, 
Um, if Saudi Arabia didn't exist, it would take a science fiction writer in an apocalyptic mood to invent it. This is, this is a, a group that picked up on this ethical oil rhetoric and uh, used it. There's, there's an ethicaloil.org organization that kind of makes this case of oil on behalf of industry. The Panglossian verdict. Canadian oil sands oil is the most, eth most ethical in the world. This is, this is Levant speaking. And the people who invest there, work there, and support the oil sands are all gradually helping to make the world a more moral, humane, and better place." End quote. This ethics of necessity, of the liberal good guys providing the energy to a world in desperate need of the stuff, is a way of knowing oil that absorbs any lingering anxieties and worries about the addition of Canada to a family of resource superpowers distinguished mainly by their dubious policies and politics. It's clear what's at stake for government and industry in the multiple fronts on which they're waging the war of rhetoric over the growth and expansion of the Canadian oil industry. There's a great deal of money to be made in oil sands. Alberta is crisscrossed with pipelines, and this is from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, just to give you some sense that the, where all those pipelines are originating in the middle there is uh, where I currently live in Edmonton, and um, they want to, this is one of the uh, maps that they put out to try to advocate for um, Keystone XL by, by, by pointing out the number of oils, uh, major pipelines are already crossed the border, um, and so on. Alberta's crisscrossed with pipelines, and multiple pipelines already make their way across the border to the United States and over the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Coast. The current struggle to expand this infrastructure, not only to accommodate new supply, but also to allow Western Canada select crude to trade more, more closely to world prices than its current discount rate, um, that's, the, that's the main reason for doing this, is to um, get more money out of the, the oil that's being sold. In this, is this expansionary activity helping to make the world a better place? Such a conclusion can only be drawn from a too easy acceptance of what, is, what already is. That we live in societies whose form and character depend entirely on oil. And of course, it is just this hypothesization of the political and social form and possibility that is challenged by those critics of the old sands whom Levant and others on the political right always criticize for not knowing what they're talking about. <clears throat> that this sets the bar high for opponents to petro societies does not invalidate their criticisms of the short and long-term consequences of oil extraction and use. To Levant's logic and the industry's logic of either or, that is, either the oil sands or something much worse, either, to put it plainly, in a way that they do, democracy or fundamentalism, the proper response is to challenge the terms of the decision itself. And this is this kind of either-or, uh, we have a, a model for challenging this either-or logic that is useful in this regard too. In his response to the Bush administration's call for the US public to pick sides after 9-11, philosopher Slavoj Žižek famously argued that Quote, what's problematic in the way that the ruling ideology imposes this choice on us is not fundamentalism, but rather democracy itself, as if the only alternative to fundamentalism is the political system of liberal parliamentary democracy, end quote. Or, in this case, then, the only alternative to unethical oil is a supposedly more ethical one. One can reject both in favor of a possibility that exceeds and escapes the necessity of, of the given in favor of some third term yet to be, ma yet to be named. And yet, maybe that parallel that I've drawn here between politics and oil doesn't work. Here, we do reach an impasse in how we might know oil that is at once political and theoretical. What is unethical about the oil that Levant contrasts the oil sands is in the main that is nationalized and not owned by private companies. State-owned oil companies control 73% of the world's reserves. Significantly, of the remainder, which is to say, the remainder of the, the privately owned, owned oil, more than 50% is located in the Alberta oil sands. For Levant, betraying the law of property always already means to concede, concede defeat to what he sees as the fundamentalism of oil states, such as Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Venezuela. Whether oil is ethical or unethical, whether it might not be possible to have a national oil company that is not fundamentalist, the one 
person, the one company that he never ever mentions in his book is Statoil, Norway's oil company. What persists amidst all the rhetoric is the necessity of oil itself. In a recent two-thirds, in a recent poll, two-thirds of Canadians reported that they believed that the country could increase its oil and gas production without generating any further damage to the environment. Wishful thinking in the extreme? Or the consequences of no better alternative to what is? The representational struggles that are taking place over the oil sands pit the language of marketing against the discourse of finitude. To this, in the absence of a miracle fuel, the left at the present can only offer dire warnings. <coughs> James Hansen, head of, the Na of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies and one of the people credited for first raising alarm about climate change, suggested in a New York Times article that to fully exploit the oil sands would place civilization at risk. The fantasy of greening something black has proven to be the more attractive vision, not only because it holds out the possibility of amelioration as opposed to transformation, but because no real alternative has otherwise been preferred. The only thing that the left can offer in its opposition to the oil sands, and indeed to the use of oil more generally, is that we stop using it. Though it might be a challenge to do so, the better option would be to try to figure out how to generate ideas of how a world of 7 billion people might use oil to different ends and for different purposes, and perhaps to a lesser extent than recent projections of the continued expansion of fossil fuel use in, into mid-century. Rejection of the resource constitutes no politics at all, hardly rising to the challenge of creating new ideas for how and why we might be better able to live without. <clears throat> I just want to quickly bring some of this together. I guess what I've been doing in my book a little bit, and what I've been trying to do here, is to position oil as an ur commodity that fuels our social imaginary. It's something much more significant than just another thing that we buy and use, another resource that we depend on. It goes beyond that somehow. It might be reductive to see it that way. On the other hand, it would be a mistake to treat it as less significant than it in fact is. As a substance fully deserving a prominent role in those alternative histories, aesthetic speculations on the future, and the political struggles in the present that I've investigated here in this paper. The energy that makes modernity possible has, until recently, never been named, and its conceptual as well as social and historical significance never explained. As I hope I've shown in the various ways that we know oil now, or need to know it perhaps, need to understand that our knowledge of it takes different forms with different repercussions, this is something that is essential to add to our calculations of both future political possibilities, as well as to our understanding of the past within which our ideas of labor and capital were born and shaped into forms on, on which we still rely. What if we were to re-narrate left politics with the energy and capacities introduced by oil as a key element of the story? How might this force us to reimagine both anti-capitalist and environmentalist politics? The insights offered by Mitchell about the significance of oil in shaping and enabling contemporary democratic governmentality tells us more about the directions taken by capitalism than the counterpoints that have, been, that have hitherto been offered by the left. The civilizational possibilities introduced by oil are seductive and far easier to defend with representational fictions of petrol plenitude, which accord with the specialized narratives of economics, as well as with quotidian common sense, than with still abstract ideas and ideals of environmental devastation on the horizon however close that horizon might be. Some representational openings might be generated by aesthetic interventions into oil, imaginaries of the kind offered by Kortinsky's oil, but most examples of oil art are more determinate and didactic, which is to say, I think, unrealistic in their renderings of what petro societies might be like in the absence of petroleum. Even work as careful as Kortinsky's has to struggle with its capacity to meaningfully intervene at the level necessary to generate social and political change, whether due to the representational struggle over oil taking place in the media, or the theoretical challenges that Jacques Rancière and others have made recently to assumptions guiding the concatenation of aesthetics and politics that have long fueled the energies of cultural critics. The introduction of oil and energy to our narratives would not invalidate left thinking, it seems to me at least, but make it more alert to the necessity of mass energy for the enormous social and infrastructural systems we inhabit, and those that we prophesize. It would also alert us to the dead end of any environmental discourse that continues to ally itself with, with, with economics, as in some variants of theories of sustainability, a discourse 
this being economics, that depends on oil being virtually free. And it would alert us to the need to create aesthetic and political interventions that oppose the narrative of endless growth with something more direct and more powerful than, than the ecological ethics on which we continue to depend. Understanding how we know oil and how we might or should know it should make us alert to the very real challenges of naming, thinking, and changing the global, of global society and the social imaginaries that we have constituted around black gold, a substance that has given us the force to shape ourselves into, the, into who we, what we are. We depend on oil in daily life, and even as we endure the consequences of having used so much of it, we one day will have to be without it. The insights into how we know oil that emerge out of, out of work such as Mitchell's and Bertinsky's and from the public struggles over the political significance of sites of oil extraction and use, as in the case of the Alberta oil sands, don't come close to addressing the challenge that Smill, remember, poses in his framing of the difficulties of transition from fossil fuel to non-fossil fuel societies. However, thinking about the diverse and distinct ways in which we know oil, and how we might come to know it differently, highlights the necessity and very real difficulty of naming the problem and narrating the changes needed in a way that don't simply reinforce the inevitability of oil and the impossibility of the transitions we so desperately need. This is at uh, McDonald's in, uh, in Edmonton. Uh, that's like part of the uh, play park for kids. Mm -hmm. We are only at the beginning of, critical, of the critical process of really knowing oil, of knowing it as fundamental to the determinations of our subjectivities and the shape of our social lives. Only by knowing oil can we start to understand fully what and who we might become without it, a task that needs to be at the heart of our political thinking today. Thanks. So we obviously have some time for questions now. I'd like to open this up. supplemented or replaced with something else without really any kind of big change to the way that we live. And that's a really important, that has been a really important part of the kind of common ideologies about how society operates, which has allowed us to not really worry too much about using a limited fuel source, or realizing the degree to which we've kind of built a global society around this specific fuel source. So when it comes to the ways in which uh, ethanol or other renewables Ethanol is not quite a renewable, but it's, um, let's say it's in that category, or imagined. It's as kind of contributing to that input that's necessary, uh, and thinking that the whole system cannot continue to operate on whatever input you come up with. And there's, I think, limits and barriers to that. Some of it has to do just with the sheer volume of input that you would need to have. It's impossible to do. Um, it's impossible to do with ethanol. Uh, you can continue to do with other kinds of inputs, but it kind of continues to limit the real question, the real issue, which is about fundamentally changing how we act, thinking how we are as subjects. So just as a thing I'd love to talk about is uh, this interesting, um, just to kind of put some weird, um, uh, to flesh this out a little bit, but in a bizarre way, um, there's a, uh, Lots of people have done this, but it originated with a French economist. He wanted to figure out um, how many slaves we would each require if there was no oil. If that ex relatively cheap, uh, high energy output fuel didn't exist. 
and we wanted to maintain our current lifestyles. And the figure that he comes to for North Americans and Western Europeans is 500 slaves. Um, and that, that suggests something very, very concrete about the degree to which we depend on that for the, you know, the current shape of how we organize ourselves. Uh, you can just, if you just Google slave equivalents, you can look at all the ways that he breaks down the statistics online. Um, and it's meant as a, as, he's not advocating slavery, of course, he's, he's intending this kind of rhetorical intervention to say, sit up and take a look at the, the shape of modernity, that modernity is oil modernity. Uh, and that we have to kind of start to factor that into how we think of ourselves, as, especially as we think about political change, especially as we think about um, addressing environmental problems. So ethanol is, to me, a kind of... Uh, um, it doesn't solve anything. It, if anything, it kind of keeps the system going by continuing to allow energy to be imagined as a neutral input. In the debate over the, the tar sands oils in the U.S., uh, it's often framed, it, the, the, I often hear public speakers, pundits, whatnot, referring to it as a domestic source of oil that will free the United States from foreign imports. As a Canadian, I wonder how you take that. It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think let me, I, I'll let, I'll let me reinforce a couple of things about this, which is intriguing. So, uh, I know that some things went quickly, but I, I think one of the one thing that makes uh, the U.S. confident about Canadian sources is not just its relationship with Canada, but the fact that Canadian sources of oil are private, and that many of the companies that are involved in the oil sands are U.S. companies, or they're Canadian-based companies that have lots of U.S. investors, or uh, whether institutional or individual, and it seems that as long as private property and capitalism operates in the way that it does, that there's nothing to worry about. Um, there was a move to nationalize Canadian oil in 1980, and it backfired terribly on the then Prime Minister Trudeau, um, and has led to his party being shut out from being elected federally in the West for the, since the last three and a half decades. I still am, I'm very curious about, um, and at some point I want to write about this, why that reaction, given that this is not a particular, this is not something that was burning people's, like, I don't know if people have strong opinions about it, but it, but it was made to be felt as a strongly aggressive action on the part of government. So what what would I say? I, I don't know. I don't. Feel, I it doesn't surprise me. I guess I would see it as less. What, what I'll do is I'll take it as a, a nice gesture, uh, <laughs> suggesting that relations with Canada are are generally good and so on. But it it, it is the way that that um, governments see it as well. So, and I think that some of that rhetoric might also be connected to the fact that um, there's two pipeline debates going on. And one of them is about a pipeline to, from Alberta across British Columbia to the coast, because Canadians, the Canadian government is not taking its chances. So if the U.S. won't take the oil, they'll just sell it to China. So Canadians are are less um, are, are are not as good friends as the U.S. might think, I suppose. <laughs> Next question. I think the statistics that I gave you um, about the, the level to which exports and, and um, GDP are connected to oil um, suggest that it is dependent. So what some economists will say, some economists will say this is ridiculous to say that it's dependent, that it's only 7% of GDP. But if you were to remove 7% of GDP, that would be a 
ferocious crash. That's an incredible amount from a, from a country, um, from a GDP. So is it dependent? Um, in the well, let me ask. Let me answer this in a kind of a, a backward way, maybe. Um, I spent. Uh, I'm sort of. I sort of live between Toronto and Edmonton, and when I whenever I fly back to Edmonton. The, it doesn't matter what time of day, it doesn't matter what day of the week. Um, the plane is probably 75% filled with oil workers. Um, the, what used to be kind of the industrial production that took place in southwest Ontario in a very, very similar fashion to Ohio or to Michigan is declining um, precipitously. And the only way in which uh, an economy like Ontario, is, especially with its working class labor force has kept going is that they commute. They commute across country and they go for two weeks, they make a bunch of money, they go home for a week. And they go for two weeks. It's incredible. It's uh they commute to the airport, there's sometimes private jets from companies to take them to work camps. Um that's their that's their source of labor. Um it's true as well from the far east coast, although that's changed a little bit because of the sources of oil that are available there as well. So there's this kind of transformation in, that I mentioned just in passing in political power and economic power in Canada that connects up with how people actually inhabit that space as well. And I think that Canada has become very dependent on oil. It's become dependent on oil for um, its sense of its, um, of its capacities in the contemporary world global economy. Right? So, so famously, um, maybe famously, again, I don't ever know what, what Americans know about Canada, but Canada, Canada didn't um, really have, feel the effects of 2008. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that it has a bunch of oil, and oil was really expensive. And so it continued to be expensive because it was necessary, and there's only so much supply at any given time, and we're probably past peak, and it's getting more expensive to search for and, 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 and. Um, There's a secondary reason that's equally significant, which is the government didn't get around to changing banking laws quick enough, they wanted to, to, that would have made it possible for there to be derivatives in the same way, and they just didn't get around to it, and then they took credit for it afterward for being smart enough never to get around to it. Um, but that, I think that the, it's, it's well known now in Canadian public life that, uh, that resources, a couple of resources are so significant to the economy that, that we couldn't do without them. And there's still a kind of a built-in, um, a way that people in major cities, so it's kind of an odd, two things happening at once, is that most Canadians live in cities, an incredible number, 85%, something like this. So they have no access, no understanding of what's happening outside of cities. And um, they both know that it's very important, and they don't see it whatsoever. They don't see the sites of trench, they just don't even care, don't think about it. And that's why you have simultaneously, you have a lot of commitment to environmental policies and a kind of, um, I guess that the, the, the word for it is it's, it's cynical optimism. You kind of imagine that if you don't think about it, don't worry about it too much, it'll go away. So there's those things going on at the same time. So there's, there's a, is there a worry about the dependence? I'd say there's no worry about the dependence. It seems like a very good thing to be dependent on. Um, there's other sites for debate about that, which is that there's a very limited amount of uh, uh, the the governments, uh, the provincial governments and the federal government extract relatively small um, monies from companies for their oil extraction, far less than it would if it was nationalized, like sort of on the order of three to five percent, as opposed to fifty in most nationalized situations, and that's getting some pressure. That's getting some. Um, my home province of Alberta, its provincial economy is entirely dependent on oil. It's something like between 35 and 40% of the provincial budget depends on oil. So small fluctuations in the price of oil uh, upend the provincial budget all the time. All the time. So there's either just enormous amounts of money and they will, they will distribute it to universities and so on, or there's just nothing and they just will then claw back. It's just a crazy, crazy schema that they are aware of, but they are, they're too dependent on. Cool. I wonder if I could ask a question.
question about the relationship between revising the social imaginary and the social change that um, might come about by using an alternative energy future. Um, it seems to me like there needs to be a revision of the rhetorical imaginary before it precedes the revision of the social imaginary. Um, you talked about oil as black gold, uh, but if it was recoded as black fool's gold, yeah. for example, that yeah. um, puts quite a different spin on things. And one of the things that I um, thought about was a real opportunity lost um, for the Obama administration at the depths of the recession, there was some talk um, related to um, uh, a figure who, who was in the administration right after the election, but of initiating what they were going to call a Green New Deal that would have really reconfigured um, energy production and labor at the same time. Um, and that to me is also a kind of revisioning of the rhetorical imaginary that um, we can only imagine uh, retrospectively what the implications of that would be. So uh, I think so. I think those are exactly the kind of moves that are important to make with certain provisions, which are that. First, I would just like, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do with my book, and I think that there's a, there are a number of other scholars that are doing this kind of investigation. There's something that myself and uh, uh, anthropologist Dominic Boyer have kind of coined the term energy humanities. And so we do things like ask questions about um, how, do, how do you think of, how do you, well, there's, an, there's a, um, a special issue of anthro, anthropology quarterly, anthropological quarterly coming out about um, what, uh, what Foucault's biopolitics looks like when you have to also think about energy in relationship to it as part of the system. Because he doesn't at all. It's not part of it. So we kind of want to make energy part of the discussion. So that's, that's one thing. Part of the discussion is about how we've configured various kinds of political, social um, formations. Infrastructural, but, but beyond that. So when you say green Keynesianism, that's, I, that's fantastic. Um, one, my hesitation in part is that, that Timothy Mitchell and others would argue that Keynesianism was a bit of a parlor trick enabled by extremely cheap oil. And that it comes to an end in 73, um, more or less, not just because there's some ideology of neoliberalism being bred um, in, with, with, in Chile and then coming to the, to the US, but because suddenly energy starts to factor in the economy as a real number. That, as I, the stat is an amazing one, from 1920s to 1970s, the average price per barrel adjusted for inflation was $2 a barrel. Um, so it doesn't factor into anything. So the, it's, the question is whether you can generate the same kind of formation that was Keynesianism, um, and when you realize what energy, the role that energy played in relationship to it. But I still take your point. I think it's extremely important to ask questions about um, how we, the, the broader questions about how energy frames the decisions that we make about the types of politics we might advocate. And I guess one of the kind of bigger questions I always have, or one of the challenges that I feel, and that I try to put to people, is about um, a, a demand for, a, a growing demand for the freedom, mobility, and possibility that you get from oil in places that have used very little of it. Um, I think the average uh, Chinese citizen uses about 6% of what an American uses in, in oil. Um, they want to use 100%. They don't use the same amount. I, I'm not saying this is articulated as, as policy, as public policy, but they want the same kind of sense, they want to occupy the same sensibility of what, they want all those energy slaves. They want all those energy slaves. Because who wouldn't, that's fantastic. It means all kinds of things. You don't have to collect fire. I don't even know what it would be. You'd collect firewood and then uh, make your coffee that you wouldn't have because you couldn't get it up here. Um, you know, so there's a real enormous growth in population that is still on the horizon until 2050. There doesn't seem to be a significant reduction of uh, use of fossil fuels on the, on the horizon either. The World Energy Council had a couple of different scenarios for energy use for the next 50 years, and in their best scenario, they suggested that there would be about a 27% increase in uh, fossil fuel use 
um, a much larger overall increase in use of energy, but a lot of that would be taken up by other um, sources of energy. And I just want that to be part of the discussion of, um, I guess, left politics and the pressures that that puts on the uh, ability to get people to change how they act and behave. And not just vis-a-vis -vis the environment and, and climate change, which is an enormously difficult representational struggle because it's just so abstract, but also with respect to, to, to politics, also with respect to how that, how that configures political systems in ways that we never even uh, thought about. And, I mean, from the Mitchell, how it configures uh, oppositional action, that we might be using the tropes and the forms of oppositional politics that came from this very different moment. And so I'd want to kind of think about energy opposition. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think that the, there has to be a rhetorical struggle, but that one that plays into this broader sense of how, how energy shapes, how forms of energy shape our social, um, sh shape social, um, social form and possibility in a fundamental way that is only now being discussed, that is only now getting the kind of attention that it should get. I think we have time for one final question. So, um, I was interested in what you said, energy didn't even uh, uh, factor into the calculations. And you know, I've seen buildings where there are like heat pipes running into the, uh, all through the building. And um, it reminds me of how some people say today is how we think of water and just never the cost of water does a factor into anything. It's hard for me to imagine how it would have been with oil, but I, I was trying to think of what is something that doesn't factor. And I think water is one of those things. Water, water has been one as well, and continues to be, although there will be pressures on that as well. I think, I think it is hard for us to imagine that oil doesn't factor in. Um, I guess what I would say is that a lot, there's, there's interesting work by uh, Syracuse University um, anthropologist Matthew Huber, who argues that kind of American car culture, which is so connected to ideas of movement and, and freedom, and um, he, he like, well, he analyzes, um, you know, the, 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 free, the, the highway system, which was quite, which is new to the, to the 20th, 20th century, he looks at the uh, you know, novels of, on the road, he looks at just the kind of, it's never remarked in, um, in uh, any form of representation that anybody needs to kind of get gas, generally. When, when gas appears in film, it's, it's only to uh, be a situation where it's, the gas station explodes, right? <laughs> which, which um, actually doesn't, doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't happen like that, but nevertheless, so the birds can't work. Um, but, it, had, it was so inexpensive to get that it was not something that would factor into the way in which you would generate a building um, for a very long time. Nor would, it, nor would it make decisions on, say, how you build um, infrastructure for, for travel. There's, that's all coming now late to, the, late to the game. We think that um, everybody we might want to have more transit. Um, but that transit is already on an infrastructure that is kind of built around a personal car. And a personal car is an incredibly powerful object, uh, both in terms of like one's own narratives of growth and development and what's, the, what's a big deal to a teen is to get their own car. It means freedom from their family, it means you can move out, you can get away from the suburb that you're in. The, the organization of cities, all of these things come about as a result of very cheap oil. Was oil to be expensive, um, then the structures would have been different. And oil has been more expensive, for instance, in Europe, where it's much more heavily taxed, and it does have some impediment to the nature of the, of the development of cities there. So I guess what I would say to that is that we're feeling the reality of the price now when it's, when it's no longer abundant. Um, when it, there's no longer kind of price crashes. When, when new oil is found, what used to happen is it would, would cause the price to crash because there's an abundance. Now that this tends to not happen, and it seems that the 90 to to $100 a barrel is going to be the likely kind of static point for oil until it becomes more and more and more and more expensive to discover. 
Um, every year since about 2005, the major oil companies who, were, who tend to lie about their statistics about how much oil reserves that they have access to and what they discover, so even if you take that into account, they report that they discover less, less oil than they, um, than they sell. So they're not replacing their own stocks, if you know what I mean. Um, Mexico as a country is now in serious trouble as a result of their fields effectively being used up. And the state has had been depending on uh, Pemex oil in a very serious way. Uh, and some years up to 40% of the state budget was based on offshore oil. And now it's declining to uh, precipitously. So they're either desperately trying to find deeper reserves, which cost enormous amounts of money, or they're kind of giving up on it and having to figure something else out. So I would say that it's, uh, it perhaps is like water. Like we don't really, we do pay for water, but it's relatively minimal. Um, I think this winter, um, when it was very, very cold, people got a wake up call around the cost of natural gas, which is actually very cheap at the moment. But even then, it was, as soon as usage went up, it became extremely hard to, act, to access it. To get it on, like the spot market price increased by, by uh, 400% over the winter in some places. Um, yeah, so it, it, I guess I would still argue that, uh, along with a number of other people, that the kind of expansionary part of global capital in the 20th century was enabled by and premised on almost cheap, almost free oil. Two dollars a barrel is not cheap when you're using, um, you know, uh, billions of barrels of it. But it is effectively, it, it, given how many, how much energy emerges from oil, it's an amazing substance. Um, it's effectively. Okay, I'm sure this discussion is not out of fuel yet, but we are out of time. So please join me in thanking him for a wonderful talk.